Welcome. Uh, I'm Noel Hidalgo, uh, Executive Director of Beta NYC. Um, and I'm really, really fortunate to be joined by two colleagues um, that are here in New York City. The Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, uh, and Brianna Vecchioni from Microsoft Civic. Um, and this morning, we're going to be talking about building data dashboards for government. So um, Gail, can you tell us a little bit about um, yourself and how did the New York City open data law come about? Well, I'm the borough president of Manhattan, which some of you have no idea what that is. But basically, we work on zoning, we appoint community boards, we fund uh, many projects in the city, particularly Manhattan. And of course, we also introduce legislation. But I was in the city council for 12 years, and I was chair of the technology committee for some of that. In fact, the story is that I supported a person named de Blasio for speaker over a person named Quinn, de Blasio lost for speaker, Quinn won, and I got technology committee because it was a bad committee in 2002. And what we worked on with Noel and others, certainly people from Microsoft, was the issue of open data. And we passed, uh, probably 2005, we started to pass in the mid-2000s an open data bill which basically states that there is to be all city agencies by 2018. Now, 10 years ago, that sounded like a long time, but it's next year. Every single agency has to put all of their data on a data portal. And we spent like three years passing it. It was thanks to the Bloomberg administration that it actually passed. It was the, the do it combination. The outside posses, as I call folks who in 2000s were very interested in working on technology. With all due respect, I didn't see any of you there. I don't know if any of you were there. But it was a situation in which technology was not a hot topic at that time. So that's how it came about. And it was and still is uh, one of the most uh, far-reaching bills in the country or in the world. We talked earlier, Madrid was just here as a city talking to us and to the administration about all they have learned from our open data portal. So that's how it happened. Now it's being used, and I think we'll talk more about that. Great. Uh, Brianna, um, how do you define data for good, and what is the excitement around data for good? Yeah. Um, so I consider data for good data that addresses uh, human conditions, right? Um, so the thing that's exciting is we all know that data reflects information about people. Data essentially is people. Um, and so attributing this kind of information to uh, really dire social needs, uh, housing, healthcare, things of that nature is what I consider data for good. Um, I think that this is particularly exciting uh, because it serves then as a powerful intergenerational tool where people from different backgrounds and, uh, and are, that are in different areas and different fields can come together um, towards a common good. So Gail and I come from very different backgrounds um, and we are united under this tool of using data to help community boards make better decisions for the general community around New York. Uh, and I want to now connect that to Gail and the work that you've been doing through the city uh, as the borough president. And so can you tell us how you've taken the role of the borough president um, and expanded its, uh, its purview and how your focus is on data? Well, one of the aspects of the borough president is zoning and land use. Uh, probably it's the number one aspect of the borough president that makes a difference every single day. So the way we operate is we try to do pre-planning. And what that means is whether it's South Street Seaport, East Midtown, you all heard maybe about East Harlem recently going through pre-planning, Inwood, NoHo Soho, Chinatown, even all the resiliency efforts that are going on around the borough and the city, all of these take planning. So you sit down with the businesses, the community boards, the stakeholders, residents, uh, the real estate people, and you say, how should, how should this community be planned? Now this is a huge topic, it's very controversial. You have to talk about density, open space, transportation, infrastructure, etc. and people get very angry. Data would help a lot. To be honest with you, um, we are doing the pre-planning now, we've already done South Street Seaport, East Harlem, we're working on Inwood, East Midtown, and we don't really have the data that would be able to give the community, because often the real estate people have the data, the city agencies have the data, but the community doesn't always have the data. So that's how we would use it. The community boards is what we're gonna be talking about today. But this data is powerful, as you know, 
and it would help us say, okay, we already have, I'm making this up, you know, so many residents in the community, how in the world can you build another tall building? Because if you do, then the infrastructure will be impacted like this and so on. You would think, you know, sometimes maybe the agencies have it. The agencies love open data because it can help them plan, but it doesn't necessarily get shared with the community. The community's got to have its own data. So that's how we could use it. Resiliency, we all know we had Sandy. Anybody who lived through it knows how horrific it was. And we don't know if we're going to have another storm. To be honest with you, there are a lot of plans and discussions, but I can't tell you that we have the data to be able to show what we need to do. Great. Um, and in my role at Beta NYC for the last two years, we've worked with the borough president to take a small group of undergraduates from the CUNY Service Corps program and to develop a boot camp program that enables them to learn data. It's also been able, uh, enabled us to figure out how to teach data. One of the problems that we've had is how do you explain municipal data, administrative data, to community boards, which are made up of 50 volunteers uh, who are really passionate about civic issues, and then two full-time staffers. And uh, through our collaboration with the borough president's office, we've been able to define a curriculum that is uh, accessible to anybody who is browser literate, um, that walks you through the city's municipal or administrative data. We take a focus on 311 data, uh, and we've now been able to turn that into a dashboard, which is called BoardStat. Um, so if you go to the borough president's website, um, you can click under community boards, and you'll see uh, this dashboard that is a very simple interface that enables community board members to have an understanding of 311 service requests. How many of you have made a 311 service request? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, uh, how many of you are happy with the 311 service request that you have made? Okay, just uh, a small <laughs> a few of you. Um, well, if you go to the borough president's website and you click on uh, community boards and get down to the board stat, you'll actually be able to see this very simple trends and analysis um, of service requests over the last seven years. Um, and this is a tool that's been built by uh, uh, and for community boards. And so for the last year, we spent 11 months going through and interviewing community board members on the type of information lenses that they want to see. Uh, and if you're into the whole dashboard game and building dashboards, you'll be like, oh, this is really simple. Well, that is because they need simple interfaces. Um, and so I want to turn to Brianna, who actually was the expert in building, helping us build this dashboard. Can you tell, um, tell the audience a little bit about that experience of what it was like to translate their needs into something like and we thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So uh, basically what happened was the Manhattan Borough President's Office in Beta NYC reached out to us and said, hey, we have this need. Um, we have this program that we've been doing a bunch of research for. And so we're looking to translate this into a super simple tool um, for community boards as well as the general public. And so we came in. Um, we had uh, some experienced members from Chicago as well as some uh, team members in New York come in and do a deep dive around the data analytics business intelligence tool that we used to build BoardStat um, called Microsoft Power BI, which is free, which is also uh, important um, because we needed uh, easy access to tools that were very powerful and could be translated into uh, something that didn't provide too high of a barrier to entry in a short period of time. So um, we came in, we did this deep dive, and then after that point, um, we had like a first iteration. It was like a day-long deep dive. And after that point, we decided that this was a project that we would continue to interface on and provide uh, an expert member, myself, to come in and help provide feature updates and iterations. And we had various uh, meetings with community boards and their liaisons to figure out what tools would actually be useful. Um, and so over the course of a few months, uh, we were able to roll out BoardStat, which was actually launched yesterday. I'm very excited about it. I want to say these two individuals launched it with community board members and amazing data jammers yesterday. And it was, it was phenomenal. It was very historic and useful and exciting. So. Congratulations. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Gail, how, how does uh, a tool like BoardStat help build trust uh, in regards to civic engagement? Well, you know, the issue is particularly post the election last November. There is a huge amount of interest in participation in community and civic affairs. And I think people don't really know what that means in many cases. You know, those who've been on the community boards do. But the civic engagement is something that in 2017, 
needs this data. It, people don't know that there are uh, issues that they can address and make a difference in. Now you asked about 311 and you got a smaller response to those that got a satisfactory answer. But I do think if you have the data in your community, then you know what you need to do as a civic society. You don't necessarily have to rely on somebody else. People don't know what the problems are. They know what their problem is for their person, but they don't know that there are others that have similar situations. And if we have a situation where it's across the board, I know you saw yesterday that heat is gonna take place, obviously in the winter in terms of a challenge. So we should be working on that, predicting it, knowing that it's gonna happen in a certain neighborhood. So when you see the data as a community, then you can figure out it is systemic and you can do something about it. That's what community boards do. That's what local officials do. But it, it only comes at them in a reactive as opposed to pre, then you have a, uh, more of a challenge. So I, I think this data could be revolutionary yeah. in terms of civic engagement. Brianna, do you have any examples from the Microsoft team that play into building trust with data and um, civic engagement? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that in terms of trust and civic engagement, it's important to realize that we're building this tool for the, gener uh, the, the general community, um, but in that we wanted to give the power back to the people and democratize that data, so to speak, um, which is why we were able to, uh, yesterday at the National Day of Civic Hacking, we provided a workshop on how to build this tool. Um, so in that we are then not being like the holders of the data and being like the only ones that can manipulate, but then like empowering the general public to create their own tools and do their own analysis so that they contribute to this, the, the general analysis of like making public life better. Um, great. Well, uh, one of the things that we're concerned about in our relationship m moving forward with the borough president's office in, in the capacity of Beta NYC and our Civic Innovation Fellows Program is that we have this, these community boards. How many of you have gone to a community board meeting or know your community board? Raise your hand. Great. Well, uh, uh, I hope that more of you who are New Yorkers uh, fully engage in the community board process. Uh, within a community board, they, they are the foundation for the capital planning, zoning, and permits. So liquor licenses, massage parlors, uh, neon signs, like anything that goes on in your neighborhood uh, here in New York has some type of function into the community boards. And there's 59 of them in the city. Right? They each represent 150,000 people, and each one of them has set up its own democratic practice on how to process information and how to process this workflow. And we're excited to, to spend the next year actually pulling apart that information workflow process so that way we can see where the State Liquor Authority kind of uh, applications flow through the community board process and then we can bring data sets and we can bring education and we can bring dashboards uh, to that environment. Uh, Gail, what, what is your grand vision? You've got four, hopefully, keep our fingers crossed, four more years. Um, and at the end of those four years, you're gonna be term limited and we, well, we would love for you to be mayor. Um, we, hope you, we, we hope you run for mayor. <laughs> Not happening. Um, Not happening. Uh, yeah. uh, what, what is your, what's your grand vision of uh, your legacy that you wanna see with, with data and open data in the city? Well, you know, it's much thanks to you and to Brianna, but the issue is uh, with the 12 community boards in Manhattan, obviously we wanna replicate it, you know, around the city, but the notion is that when you walk into a community meeting, community board meeting or a civic engagement meeting of any kind, you have the data up on the screen. Because right now, you walk into a community board meeting, both of you who've been there, and you've got a lot of paper, or you might have a, somebody might have an iPad, but you have a lot of paper usually. And you spend a lot of time figuring out what is that data. It's all done verbally, it's very seldom up on the screen. It will be now, hopefully, the community boards in Manhattan. But the issue is lack of planning is what's upsetting people so much in our city. If you find the, uh, the angst is how come we don't have clean parks in some cases? How come the transportation is uh, not happening in my neighborhood? How come the bus service for the seniors? You can't imagine just a discussion of slow buses would make the seniors very happy if they were to show up on time. The seniors wait and wait and wait because they can't get down the subway. You could go on and on. The noise issue, I happen to love noise. My husband hates it. But that whole issue of noise is on the community level very high in terms of upsetting people. There may be ways of dealing with it. After hours permits for the construction, for instance, something I object to, but they exist. Are there places where they exist and what is the impact? You get the picture. 
local issues, my block, my community, everybody votes nationally when it comes to the presidential, but I tell you, they bitch and complain locally. And you know, how many, how many um, situations were overcrowded um, you know, in a neighborhood? How many places where you have, um, I hate to mention Airbnb, but you know, all of these issues, um, disruptive technology is a good thing, but let's look at the numbers. Where does it work and where doesn't it work? Illegal hotels and so on. All of these people would feel empowered, as Brianna say, about their neighborhood and they'd want to do more about it. That's what would be my dream, would be to give people the tools, but they have to be extremely easy. They have to be something that they can do quickly and almost as quickly as, you know, um, the work that you can do as your, your workplace or the 311 information. It has to be really accessible, and that's what we're working towards. So it's not even just at the community board, available to the public, and then they would perhaps participate. I want people to participate more in their local community. They would then vote more, perhaps, and they would participate more. The community would improve. We need, we need every single person in this room. Great. Uh, 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 one, one more, and then we're gonna, get, we're gonna get to questions. So Brianna, as a uh, civic technologist, what is, what is your grand vision um, in this ideal world of data dashboards for government? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of directions that this could go in. Um, I think, first and foremost, the priority um, is increasing the quality of the data, uh, as we have a lot of data scientists in the room, and we all know that uh, data is messy, and it requires a lot of cleaning, and it requires a lot of preliminary analysis. Um, and so something that, uh, in particular to bring up like a, something that we discovered in BoardStat, is when we were trying to find um, the average time to close for a, a particular 3 on one ticket, uh, we were trying to find it across agencies. So community boards came to us, and expressed the need to hold agencies accountable, and they wanted to know what was the average time to close for a certain agency across tickets. So uh, we were doing that analysis, and we actually found that a lot of the averages were negative, um, which didn't make any sense. But when we went back and looked in the data, we saw that a lot of the close dates were listed as dates prior to the opening dates. Mm. Um, and this was something that we, we knew had happened on a one-off chance sometimes, um, but the scale of which we didn't understand until we had started doing this dashboarding. Um, and so that was an opportunity for us to then translate that information to those collecting the data and saying, hey, these are some really tangible ways that you can improve just making sure that these fields are inputted correctly, um, et cetera, et cetera. So after that point, assuming that we get to, to the point where our data schema is solid and the quality is solid, um, I would love to see some kind of like predictive prototyping, which we saw a little bit of yesterday in the National Day of Civic Hacking. We had some wonderful volunteer groups who presented some of this predictive technology. Um, but again, it rests on the measurement models, right? It's your analysis is only as good as your data is and as complete as your data is. Um, and so I think that that is ultimately the end goal. Um, but we need to focus right now on, on creating solid data that we can then do that subsequent analysis. Yeah. And the way for us to get there is going to take time. Uh, I don't know how many of you have worked with government or done government contracting beforehand, um, but it's a very laborious and time-consuming process. Your runway for operations needs to be looking at maybe one or two years, which is absolutely absurd when you're thinking about in the technology disruption, innovation, insert whatever here. Um, it, the, the frank reality is that the process for us to be up on stage today uh, has taken years uh, to first develop a trust uh, where Gail and her colleagues can trust young people like myself and Brianna to essentially say, we have a problem and we don't want you to necessarily uh, make fun of us. We want you to come in and help us and be collaborative to address these issues. It's taken us a year and a half to really win over the trust of community boards um, who are very skeptical of our, kind of like our in this room, field of, hey, we can just build a dashboard and we'll be able to address these problems like that. And the frank reality is that there's a lot of trust that has to be built on both sides. And there's a lot of patience because we have to essentially reinvent our own understanding of what information looks like for our elders. Um, and be able to be in a position where we can say, hey, let's make this super simple for their decision-making process, and let's uh, be seen as equals within that ecosystem. 
And so uh, with that, I want to then take the next 25 minutes and see if we can get some questions. So uh, this gentleman had a hand up. Who are the people that have ha uh, questions? Can you just stick your hand up in the air? All right, we want the first question here, and then we'll go across the room. So great. If you can just say uh, your, your name uh, and your hometown affiliation. Uh, my name is Ion. My name is Ion Freeman. I'm I'm from one of the other boroughs, um, from from uh, Fort Sterling and Brooklyn Heights. So so President Brewer, uh, you know I'm a I'm a New York City school parent, and uh, both of my children when they were in kindergarten, there were waiting lists for uh, for our local school, yeah. right? So you know the there's been a lot of residential building, and there's been a lot of effort in the city government, especially in the the Bloomberg years. Of bringing people uh, back into the city to raise to raise families <laughs> until they reach middle school, sorry. Um, but the school building authority, as you know, is is critically underfunded. Uh, you know, we we built a lot of residential buildings in downtown Brooklyn. There's a problem everyone could see coming for for 15 or 20 years, right? That we would run out of space in our schools, right? So I don't think data was a problem. So I think the culture of responsiveness to data. Um, in our in our political decision makers has been has been lacking. Do you see that changing? Yeah, I mean that's such a good question. It happened on the Upper West Side. I have to argue with you a little bit because even though we all um, we didn't agree on the data, and just the example. In other words, sometimes the community would point out the density coming up, and the school construction authority would say they're all going to private school. So we would have those kinds of discussions. I know, but I'm just saying it was, I had those discussions. Not true. They were wrong, you were right, we were right, but the data is sometimes in dispute between the city and the community. But the issue then, and, and, and back in the 2000s when the buildings were being built in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, uh, to be honest with you, the uh, community had to spend hours without you know, digging the data from different places. We didn't have dashboards, we didn't even have, to be honest with you, the portal up and running. So I do think that um, the government pushed with real data that we're going to have as a result of these kind of discussions will be more responsive because the data wasn't necessarily um, available to the community. I, we had to FOIL. We had to actually FOIL for data um, in many cases. So I, I, I think I answer your question. The, the density is now, because of the push in Brooklyn and Manhattan, people at School Construction Authority, which is what the agency is, now realize that they've got to build more schools because the schools are better, more parents are going. The endless discussion about right now pre-K, there are places in Manhattan, you're supposed to be able to get a pre-K slot. You can only go like from 50th Street down to 14th Street to get a pre-K slot. So the whole issue of DOE and data and school construction authority, it's sometimes it's the algorithms of how they're doing, I don't know if you're in high school yet, good luck, all hell. You, put down 12 schools, you get none of them, okay? I could go on and on about the, the challenges of the algorithms that the Department of Education is using. It, it's a very good question, Deal, we, this could help. Yeah, there's also, there's two pieces of legislation that are in City Council right now. Uh, one, uh, um, Borough President Brewer uh, introduced with um, City Council Member Vaca, which is the city's open data 2.0 bill, which is essentially looking at the, the current legislation that was passed, Gail's legislation that was passed in 2011, uh, no, local law, uh, 11 of 2012, so the law that was passed in 2012, how are we gonna revise it uh, for the next four years? The, the current legislation ends in 2018, but how do we create the legislation as a framework that expands its, its scope so that way it includes more of the authorities uh, and uh, municipal agencies so that way we get this type of transparency that enables us to hold government accountable um, so that legislation is currently being debated and under discussion, and your input is sorely needed. The second thing is what that Gail brought up is that there's an algorithms bill uh, that was introduced by Councilmember Vaca, which would bring transparency to government algorithms. Uh, there's going to be a hearing next month, and that would essentially open up and force the city to publish how it writes its algorithms, whether it's for high school or whether it's for uh, service delivery, um, whether it's around the decision-making process of how many seats are supposed to be placed within different types of communities for schools. Um, and that's a real, that would be a pioneering, that would be equally as pioneering as the open data bill was in, in uh, 2012. And we hope to get that council bill passed and that's also going to be up for discussion. So those are two places that you can help 
hold agencies accountable through legislation. So what was the second bill called? Uh, algorithms. Yeah, it's a trend. Uh, it's yeah, the algorithms bill. Um, it's uh, uh, it's going to be under the technology committee. It's open algorithms. I don't think uh, the council member Vaca has a sexy name for it. So maybe if you want to brand it, you know, some way, maybe open algorithms as we did with open data. I want to go to the next question, which was this uh, woman here in the front. Hi, Mike. I'm Nicolette Richards, I live here in Manhattan, so I should be attending the community board meetings. Mm -hmm. um, but my question really was about um, keeping or allowing for consistency of data collection. I know you, one of your biggest roadblocks is trust and getting people to agree to collect certain data. Um, but, um, and I've worked you know, with Department of Defense in the past and I know that there's a lot of red tape, right? But um, in terms of getting the data um, on a consistent basis, what, what kind of methods or practices are you guys employing, considering that you use a lot of volunteers and there might be a lot of turnover in that area as well? I, I mean, I think it would be enlightening if maybe, Noel, if you could talk or speak to some of the current ways that data is generated yeah. uh, within local government. So we're very fortunate to have uh, 311 in New York City. Um, the 311 data set has evolved in its openness and accessibility um, thanks to uh, stewards like uh, uh, Borough President Brewer. Um, actually, Gail uh, passed a, uh, a law back in 2005 that started the process of opening up 311. Uh, and 311, as we see it, is the people's data set because it's reflective of essentially our, our problems, our needs. But it's only reflective of those needs of people who feel that government can actually address their problem. Right, so there, there, there continues to be this this gulf between the those who feel that government actually provides a solution, and then those who actually don't give a crap because they don't ever see government addressing their problems, and that's really expressed within the system that we see the tale of two cities between the uh, people that live in our, our municipal public housing in NYCHA, um, and then those people who live not in NYCHA. Currently, the City Housing Authority uh, um, service complaints are inaccessible to the public uh, and are inaccessible to the residents of NYCHA. They cannot see which mold or where their deteriorating housing conditions are uh, because that is, quote unquote, a state authority. And so uh, there has been efforts to bring transparency in that data collection and sharing process, but it is still not as at the same level that 311 is. Um, and as data, uh, as our government kind of evolves to understand the value of data, we're constantly seeing 311 tickets and issues evolve. Um, we're really fortunate to get, um, to, to have the last administration and this administration focus on rebuilding 311. Uh, if, how many of you have ever called 311 for a heat and hot water complaint? One? Okay, um, uh, the, if you track and you look at 311 heat and hot water complaints, there's four different, um, uh, uh, not content types, but uh, descriptors and as well as primary um, uh, complaint types. And that's evolved over time and, and it's getting more granular, um, but it takes a constant pressure from uh, uh, data activists or data consumers to make sure that government has clean data and that's very, uh, uh, it's, it's usable. Um, so the onus is on us to make sure that government is producing clean data and you have to be vocal. You just can't complain about it. Like, or you just can't hold the complaint in. You have to complain about it through city council testimony. And when we pass the open data bill, there is a opportunity to complain. And I think one of the things we have to do is make sure that that complaint is taken seriously. I do think, uh, in this administration and in the past administration, uh, pressure is now on on the open data. Uh, City Planning Commission was with you yesterday, yep. and that's been a commission that has, uh, you know, needed some push. Department of Buildings needs a big push. <laughs> um, those of you who had to work with them. So the, the agencies have legacy systems. That's the other problem. Um, and those that do perhaps are less responsive to what we're trying to do. So some of it's internal, you know, they're not volunteers, they're city paid. Um, maybe we need more people working on data in city government, that's another suggestion. 
Yeah, uh, and to answer a question on the more technical side, um, I think that you know inherently this is like an interdisciplinary issue because we can create data schemas that are solid and, and would instruct you know clean collection of data. Um, but like you said, oftentimes when you're working with volunteers, you know things can get messy and there's a lot of turnover and you don't necessarily have the accountability um, as as uh, Gail and Noel were expressing. Um, so maybe in that instance, it might be time to look at how we're collecting data, right? Because even when we're collecting these three-on-one complaints, that's only people who call in or like go out of their way to write down their issue in a form and submit that to local government. Um, and so there's a lot of like omitted information from people. How many times have I had a problem with New York City and never called in three-on-one? Most times, right? Um, and so maybe we need to th rethink how we are collecting the data around improving the city as well. In the back over there. I want to know um, how this could be used to um, track people who are losing their homes, whether they're being harassed by the landlord, I mean very badly harassed, or they've been priced out, or um, you know, these type of things, and they wind up on the street. And I, when I say this, I'm talking about people who have a long history of living in New York, being uh, born in New York, going to high school in New York, raising families in New York, or, or whatever, and then finding themselves uh, homeless on the street. And how can we track that, assuming that anyone would care about that, but at least have data on that and see if we can't do something to uh, create housing for these people and address the homeless issue. And if you run for mayor and you are open to that, I'd be leaning towards you, as I say, leaning towards you. <laughs> I'm, I'm open to making sure people don't end up homeless and open to figuring out how to do it. One of, I, you know, one of the problems, oh boy, would be to work between the state and the city. That's another challenge. The state uh, controls our housing in terms of rent regulation. That data is on the state level. Noel, Brianna might know, I have a feeling that that database is not shared with the city database. In other words, what are all the rent regulated apartments in the city of New York? as an example, and how can they be integrated into the city system. The second issue, of course, would be to take the court system, right, which is state, um, who has dealing right now with any kind of an eviction, right, in the court, uh, put that into a database that mirrors the rent regulation, that mirrors some of these other issues. Um, third issue, of course, is those who are in homeless shelters, right, either tier twos or anything else, mostly families, for instance. How do you figure out, um, they run around with vouchers, if you may or may not know. No landlord takes the vouchers. How many landlords don't take the vouchers? And how can you find an apartment, and even in a new building, that's low enough in terms of the rent to fit I into that I feel that's family? part of the problem, that's because the problem. they focus too much on these shelter issues. Mm -hmm. We have, and a lot of the shelter issues deal with a different issue, which is a mental uh, uh, illness issue, which is why people don't want to go into the shelters, because they have to deal with that. You have a lot of people, just like the school system, you have a lot of brilliant, brilliant kids that are dropouts on the street that you don't deal with. Mm -hmm. They're not in the school because the school is dangerous, and they're smarter than the school. And you automatically assume because they're dropouts that they are these other kids that are, you know, going in and out of the prison, all this other stuff, which right. is not true. And you do the same thing with homeless people because they're not going in the shelter. They don't have vouchers. Therefore, they are not counted. Right. But you can count them when you see them in court. And you got uh, strange men uh, roaming in their apartment with the keys. Then you got, you know, beating up but while you're walking the dog, threatening you, all this other stuff. And they wind up on the street. Right. I mean, we can have a longer conversation. I think a lot of the people in the family shelters in particular, not mentally ill, they just couldn't afford the rent. I mean, that's my experience. But we could have a longer conversation. I think it's a really good question about how to measure and then figure out how that data can be used to keep people in their home and make sure they don't end up on the street in the first place. It's a very good question. Uh, on the Twitter, if you're on the, the hashtag D for good, D for G, what is it? D for G. 
All right, you know it. Uh, if you search on that hashtag, I just posted um, a, a link to um, one of the slides from yesterday's um, uh, hack uh, uh, data jam that we had, which was more or less a hack day around 3-in-1 data. And they identified that there are three data sets that need to be unified. Uh, one of them is Pluto. Uh, the other one is coredata.nyc, which is produced by the Furman Center, and then taxbills.nyc, which is another civic hacker project. If you could bring all three of those massive data sets uh, into one unified platform, you'll be able to start looking at affordable housing. You'll be able to start seeing where, um, where we're seeing uh, discriminatory housing practices uh, within the city. Um, and sadly, the type of discrimination that renters are facing uh, only shows up in the data um, uh, uh, long after that person has been uh, a victim of the type of predatory housing practices in New York City. Um, and so we need a combination of things, as Gail uh, enumerated. Uh, we need better data. We also need stronger housing laws that help protect people within the buildings that they're living in um, and to give people that type of authority and protection when they go to court so that way they don't lose their housing. But if you want to start from a data perspective, uh, Pluto, Core Data, and Tax Bills will give you a foundation to start doing your analytics. I want to go to this young lady over here in the front. Thank you. Uh, Nadine Levick, and I'm an emergency physician with a Hopkins and Columbia background, and I'm the founder of the iRescue Project. And the question I have for you is about a really unusual data set. Yes, I've complained about my apartment being 95 degrees in the winter, because that's unbearable, but it didn't kill me. The data set I want to speak to is the data set of public access defibrillators. New York City stands alone in the country with the worst cardiac arrest survival in the country. The uh, defibrillator database, public access defibrillators, has about maybe 10% of the defibrillators in the city in it. And I don't know that any one of those defibrillators is even there or working or having good batteries. Being an ER doc and seeing people come in in cardiac arrest and they're dead and they're dead and they're dead and there's nothing I could do, with my little public health degree from Johns Hopkins, we actually embarked on a project that actually went deployed into the public yesterday called iRescue. And it's to crowdsource defibrillator locations. Very few places anywhere in the country and few places in the world has it been possible for that data to be collected, validated and pumped into the 911 system so anyone that calls 911 can be told, hey, there's one sort of near you, go get it. If you want to know more about that project, we've got a poster downstairs. But it gets to the, the points everyone's raised here. There's important data that we need to have in the city's hands and in the community's hands. And so I, I ask you, um, this is a really important data set. We shouldn't in New York have the worst cardiac arrest survival in the country. We should have the best. So that involves engaging community locally. It involves being able to access crowdsource data, validate it, and pump it into where it needs to be in the government databases. We're going to need your help. Well, that's a, that could be a, a local law. You could there spend, is a local yeah, No, there's a local, local law. Local law 20 and Council very Member few, Otto, uh, very few, very few places are in compliance with local uh, law 20. And at the moment, if you want to find out where a defibrillator is, you call Joe at the Regional EMS Council. He sits down with his Excel spreadsheet spends a couple of days looking and he says, oh, you know, Nadine, we don't have one at Grand Central Station where a million people go in and out every day. And you go down to Grand Central Station and sure enough, they do have one and you it's under lock. the man right in the blue shirt next to you. He'll figure out how to do it. His name is Tom McMahon. Hi there. Well, please take, <laughs> ta take a look at the iRescue poster and please join the community in helping with this life-saving database. We will figure out how to deal with your issue. That is a... Uh, an issue can, that can be solved. Thank you. Right, I'm trying to ping pong. I think this lady in the front, not to make the microphone holder walk as far as possible. Thank you. Hi, my name's Chris. I live in Manhattan. Uh, my question is about the design of the dashboard. I just took a look at it on my phone. I'm curious how you balanced providing a lot of detail with like knowing the audience is probably going to have a range of data literacy, they're just community members, they're not data experts. Um, how did you decide how much detail to provide versus kind of how much to make it really basic and accessible? 
Yeah, um, so I think that when we started actually going into the iterative process of building the dashboard, um, there had been a lot of research done already by the Beta NYC team um, and their fellowship group. And so they came to us already with kind of these certain requirements around, OK, we need like some kind of way to hold agencies accountable. We need some sort of way to track certain types of tickets. Um, and so I think that because the, the way that we ended up solving a lot of those problems is building uh, a more general tool. So if you look actually on, on the board stat dashboard, um, a lot of them are configured as search tools where you put in like a complaint type and a certain descriptor and then you can filter for a specific period of time. Um, and so that way it could address the needs of actual community boards if they wanted to, to look at a more granular subset of data, but also knowing that we were going to release it to the general public so that if you put in a complaint um, and you wanted to see that reflected on a grander scale, you can do so uh, by, by looking at like all the history of all the data as opposed to subsetting for like, oh, the most recent 10 days or something like that. So um, the, the reason why it is so simple is we went to five different community board offices and we met with the district manager, um, which is essentially the head honcho of their, like, their own little agency head inside of a three-person office. Uh, and then we sat with count, um, uh, board members and we said, okay, here is this very rough prototype. Uh, let's walk through some of the subcommittee or committee use cases that you would be looking for. Uh, and we came uh, on a number of different vectors. It would tend to end up on uh, noise complaints or if somebody walked into their particular um, community board district office and had a complaint in regards to a building, how would you just do these simple lookups? And the simplicity of the tool is to start a conversation around trust within this data set and to build literacy within community boards. Um, and if you send, um, if you go to the borough president's webpage and there's an email address there, boardstat at manhattanbp.nyc.gov, I will um, email you kind of the little template that we use to do trainings, which are very simple use cases that uh, introduce you to uh, the different views and how you would use those different views. Uh, and you bring up the good point that I should probably post the link to that training on that page so that way people can see how you can use every single view in its simple form to answer different questions. Uh, and, and really, and what's odd in this environment is that this is just the beginning of a broader literacy uh, uh, campaign that will hopefully enable people like you to join community boards because they recognize your value and your skills within data and that we need to have potentially um, data-centric individuals or data literate individuals on every single committee so that way you're able to use your professional skills and to hold agencies or hold the in engagements um, accurately. I'm but trying to think. You have to yeah. be a lot, very patient to be on a community board and you also have to stay for a long time. I just want to let you know. All right, let's go right over here. Hi, I'm Sylvia. I came in 2000 from a South American country. And uh, at the beginning, I, I could not believe all you can see through the website, all the data posted. Um, I, I browsed a lot through the buildings department data. Uh, uh, and suddenly then you you start to get used to it and you take it for granted and and then start that you can make things better and better like the dashboards and after becoming a parent you start seeing new um, needs like uh, we use the public transportation yellow buses and i was about to download an app, I wanted to buy an app from the app store. There was none. Mm -hmm. Maybe the city had one. And I could not believe in 2015 in New York, there's nothing uh, to address that need. And I asked other moms, how do you do? Oh, no, we do WhatsApp list. So if everybody could find that need and collaborate, uh, all the community will benefit from it. Okay. I mean, it's a, good, it's a very good point. I just think I start laughing because if I know the contracts for the buses and I start laughing. So, well, and, but it's and a very good idea. About uh, the 
bureaucracy and the red uh, tape, uh, I presented it, it to them. Do a little history on the history of the bus contracts and you'll start laughing too. <laughs> but, but it is definitely a, a very good idea. I went to the public transportation office to present the, the project. Mm. And what happened? Uh, they told me that they have a project in five years. So, yeah. so <laughs> that was for 2021. Well, we'll, I, it, it's another good idea that we're taking note of and we will follow up. It's an excellent idea. Thank you. Great. Uh, with, with 11 seconds, 10, 9, 8, I want to say thank you very much uh, for, for spending this last 45 minutes uh, with us. Um, uh, um, Please provide that type of commentary to the legislation that's being uh, uh, in city council in regards to algorithms and open data. I mean, if we can get the data out there, we will be able to hopefully build those types of systems for ourselves. Uh, that's not, that's only a band-aid for this broader inequality. And so we need your skills to go onto community boards, to run for city council, to join different agencies. We need you within government. Um, and um, thank you for your day. Uh, and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you, Noel.